Well, there's Seymour Rock's reporting from Down Under. Uh, it saddens me greatly to have to uh, report on this. Uh, I'm just going to play, if I can find it, uh, just this little uh, segment. It leaves me in a place where it just kind of underscores the need for me to, no matter what, I, I feel obliged. And, and I think it's morally irresponsible. And, and uh, I think if you look at it from the perspective of obligation to serve the earth and future generations, younger generations, anyone that thinks they're going to just sit back and, oh, well, what the hell, whatever, if you're not going to at least try, I find that repugnant. So anyway, uh, there we are. Um, I just want to put that now in a uh, in a context. Uh, so I'm just going to play the whole uh, segment now. All right. Most people, I think, here are probably familiar with Guy McPherson. And you explained to me before we sat down tonight that when you began the book, you were in kind of a mindset that you compare to his, and you describe him as somewhat extreme and uh, kind of a, I guess, the wizard at the Temple of Doom. Uh, and as I read the book, your own feelings shifted in several different directions, and as you end the book, you talk about being in grief and dealing with grief. It appears you started out very angry. So um, just notice the, uh, the question, uh, how the question was uh, phrased. And by your own description, somewhat judgmental. Talk about that evolution. Right. So... Guy McPherson is a, a brilliant evolutionary biologist who really, for me, connected all the dots of, it's not just about looking at, you know, scientific reports on Arctic trees, oceanic warming, coral, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but you have to kind of look at it in total. And he put together this essay extremely heavily hyperlinked to all the different scientific reports and pulled it all together and really showed um, look, this is how far along we are. Look, all this stuff's happening all at once. It's been happening for a while. Here's all these feedback loops. And I always going to owe him, um, a debt of gratitude for helping me kind of connect all these dots. And he was actually in that 2013 article that I mentioned and, and I quoted him at length, but, um, where I differ now with, some of his analysis is, and I, I used to believe like putting all this together and think, look, it's over. We're done. Like, what's the point? Um, we're off the cliff. And, and I, I spent a lot of time in that place, but what, what's happened in the book of, of going through this process and having to literally go say goodbye to some places, like going to places in Alaska where I used to hike across glaciers that were 300 feet thick and they're completely gone in a matter of a decade. Um, and, and, and having these direct experiences of loss and feeling these gut punches and, and, and the emotions that came with that. And then really coming back into the end, and this is why really the ending of the book and the events that led up to me writing the final ending of the book were so impactful of meeting a person like Stan Rushworth who – sharing with me this idea of our obligations to serve the earth and our obligations to serve the next generations. And this doesn't cancel out how grim things really look and where all the science is pointing, but instead it's kind of shifted this thing inside of me that I, no matter how grim that looks and no matter how almost certain it looks like things are going in that direction, no matter what I feel like, I have a moral obligation to the planet and to the next generations to still do absolutely everything that I can to try to fight, to try to conserve, to try to change this situation. And the other thing that really came into my consciousness is that Stan has pointed out, and there's studies to back this up, that 
for example, there's an area where rattlesnakes were just being killed off by humans. Just, you know, they're trying to exterminate them from a complete area. And literally in one lifetime, the rattlesnake started to then be born without rattles. So there was this abrupt adaptation happening. And then similarly, there was an area where elephants were being wiped out for their tusks. And literally in one to just a few generations, they started being born without tusks. Or they wouldn't grow, they stopped growing tusks. So, at, so, so it's like life is going to live and it's going to adapt and it's always going to try to live. And I write about this in my book about finding trees up on summits of mountains where they shouldn't be there. Like in the Olympic mountains and the summit, 2,000 feet above tree line, nothing but rock. And there's literally the scraggly tree just growing up out of a rock. And, and life is always going to try to find a way. And I'm not saying that this means for sure there's a guarantee that somehow humans are going to make it through this, but it leaves me in a place where it just kind of underscores the need for me to, no matter what, I, I feel obliged. And, and I think it's morally irresponsible. And, and uh, I think if you look at it from the perspective of obligation to serve the earth and future generations, younger generations, Anyone that thinks they're going to just sit back and, oh, well, what the hell, whatever, if you're not going to at least try, I find that repugnant. So there we are. Uh, I'll go back to, uh, to Guy now. Um, so Guy was pretty sensitive about this, and I'm not at all surprised uh, given what he has been through and continues to go through every day with uh, with death threats from just being the mess messenger. Uh, I have to say from the outset that, uh, well, I've been an admirer of uh, Dar Jamil, especially his very brave coverages in Iraq, and he did some very good things. Um, on uh, deep water horizon, then he's gone on to climate change. But it has to be said that, if I've got it right, uh, that really what had started him on this path, apart from his own observations and things, that he has this debt of gratitude uh, to Guy McPherson and to his 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 long essay. And he does, uh, to give him credit, uh, acknowledge that. Uh, so... Guy is saying, are you suggesting I haven't sacrificed enough, even though I've sacrificed far more than you can possibly imagine? Are you suggesting that I've given up, that I'm encouraging others to do the same, because that's what I'm hearing? What more do you expect from me? Well, uh, you know, and then he goes on, and then uh, he doesn't hear from, uh, from Da, and then... Finally, he gets this response. Guy, I have often both publicly and privately acknowledged you for your role in shaping my thinking about climate disruption. And uh, to be fair, uh, he does it in, this, uh, in the answer to this question. Uh, please know that the unflattering words of mine you mentioned were not directed at you. I wish you the best. Well... That sounds a little bit disingenuous to me because we all know the criticisms that are laid at the feet of uh, of uh, Guy McPherson, and they're exactly what he says, uh, you know, of of encouraging people into non action, etc. So it's a little bit disingenuous to say uh, that the unflattering words were not directed at Guy. Of course they bloody were. I mean, that's, that echoes everything, all the, the uh, ad hominems that are placed at his feet constantly um, because people can't accept what he's saying. So, I mean, despite that, I think uh, that's a very disingenuous response and... Of course, those comments were directed at Guy, and so they could be construed as as an attack. 
But the thing was, uh, I, I've got no idea what he says in his book, and I'm probably never likely to because I don't think I'm going to read it. Um, but for me, the main uh, guilt for this episode is actually the uh, journalist Peter B. Collins. I thought that was an absolutely despicable uh, question um, that uh, kind of encouraged a response like that. That's what he was looking for. I mean, it's quite it's there right in the in the, in the question if you if you uh, read it and in a way it was an entrapment. Um, so that's very unfortunate. And then Guy has gone back and um, the Guy never attacks people. Um, and that's what people always say, oh, Guy's nasty person and he attacks people. He doesn't. He is incredibly sensitive about uh, what's directed at him. And of course, he reacts reflexively as uh, as we all would. We wouldn't be human if we if we weren't. So he kind of goes back and said, well, you lied, basically. And the upcome of that outcome of that is that um, um, according to Guy, uh, Darjamil has uh, has blocked him on social media and he has clearly chosen to join the growing crowd of people who plagiarize and defame me. Were it not for plagiarism, betrayal and defamation, uh, they would be little bit response to my message. The response by Dar is exemplary. And of course that's, that is uh, inflammatory and I, 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 I completely understand it. I see it more as a um, uh, as a reflection of the absolutely insane world that we live in. Um, what Guy has said has been uh, kind of shown to be the case in spadefuls, in fact probably uh, confirmed in Dar Jamil's um, uh, own rendition of the, of the, of the facts. Um, but people don't want to hear this message um, and they don't really want to deal with um, uh, with the evidence. I think that uh, people's own personal kind of response is um, is their own matter. Um, although I find it a bit strange that you could go from hopelessness to hope. That's that's a very uh, strange response to uh, um, to the unfolding events, very strange. Um, but when you do something like this, Peter B. Collins, and kind of invite someone to attack someone else, I just find that uh, absolutely obnoxious, even more than anything that comes from Dar Jamil. Anyway, that's my two cents worth. Um, yeah, there's a Seymour Rocks from Down Under. <laughs>